let's get started. I, uh, I want to be here for this, and I just got Paige to Mars. The Simple Gifts soundtrack is going to be ringing in my ears in just a few minutes. So, But uh, we're very excited to have Chris Ellison as our uh, this year's Thomas Covey lecturer. Um, if you were here last night, you remember a lot of the introduction, but I'll uh, repeat it because there are several new persons here. Uh, Dr. Ellison is the Ohio State University Distinguished Professor. He's a Robert M. Zollinger Professor of Surgery, and he was formerly Chair of the Department of Surgery, which is one of the foremost uh, departments of surgery in the U.S. Now he's CEO of the faculty group practice. He was Vice Dean for Clinical Affairs at School of Medicine, and now he's Interim Dean of the School of Medicine, something I'm sure will be permanent and straight away. He's a Columbus native. He was an undergraduate at the University of Wisconsin, where he went to the Medical College of Wisconsin. He uh, did his uh, general surgery training at the Ohio State University. And he's been there since 1984, both as a training program director and chair of the department. He's held leadership positions in uh, most of the major professional organizations in American surgery, including being a director of the American Board of Surgery and as chairman. Uh, he's been secretary of the American Surgical Association. He's been president of the Society of Surgical Chairs. And he's held leadership positions in the American College of Surgeons. Uh, he's on the editorial board of the American Journal of Surgery and the Journal of American Cancer, uh, American Cancer Society, American College of Surgeons. And uh, last night's was a uh, terrific uh, um, exposition on experience with uh, Zollinger-Ellison Ellison syndrome. Today he'll be sharing with us his expertise in another major area for which he's known, and that's leadership and surgery. Chris, thank you very much for visiting and being this year's uh, Tom Covey Lecture. Thank you very much. Again, uh, thank you for the nice introduction, and I, I know you got paged out just to go to the emergency room or something. So, uh, I had a great uh, afternoon yesterday. I uh, enjoyed meeting uh, many of you and had a wonderful dinner with Dr. Covey and his wife and got to know, uh, learn about them and how they met and their family and their dog and all kinds of things. So it was a great, uh, great evening. Two years ago, the uh, Dean of the College of Medicine approached me and asked me to develop a mentoring program across the entire College of Medicine that included uh, 1,700 faculty. The program could be adapted to residents as well as faculty, so that would be an additional 900 uh, physicians that would need to have some type of mentorship. And uh, you know, I was curious as to, you know, well, I mean, this seems like a daunting task. I mean, where do you begin to develop a uniform mentoring program across the departments? And I said, you have to have, there has to be some demonstrated value uh, in this. And uh, I hope to demonstrate uh, during this presentation the value of mentoring. Uh, the impact it can make uh, both on the mentee or the person that's being advised as well as the mentor, uh, it's a really a positive experience. And there is data not only from our own institution, from other health science centers, but also industry that people that have a mentor are likely to succeed quicker. Uh, are more likely to be retained at your institution, and that's a big issue today, uh, given the fact that we have you know, an impending shortage of physicians, particularly for health science centers. We need to retain our faculty, and we need to make sure that they're successful. When I meet with the chairs on this topic, you know, I indicate to them that the faculty and our residents are our most important resource. I mean, Clearly, we, we hire young people, we bring them into the institution, and it's our responsibility to cultivate them, to let them grow and expand their horizons and be successful. If our faculty is successful, the whole place gets better. And so over a two-year period of time, we've kind of rolled this program out. And I'd like to share with you some of our um, uh, observations during this period of time. So as I indicated yesterday, I have no 
personal conflicts of interest or financial disclosures relative uh, to this presentation. Um, our objectives are outlined here. Um, how many of you know the, what the definition of mentorship is? Uh, somebody, ra raise your hand. Anybody? Okay, well, we'll try to define that. I, I will give you direct evidence that uh, the impact of mentoring, I think uh, the, the key feature of our program, which is a sentinel and the foundational, is to have a home for the faculty other than your department. So you need to have a faculty home, which we call fame, and I'll go over that a little bit. And then we had to figure out, well, how, how are we going to mentor 1,700 people? Uh, and we developed a distributed model, uh, which uh, we're kind of rolling out. So we're about eight, nine months into the rollout of this plan that's been two years uh, in the making. And I think it's important to understand that there are different types of mentors. It's important to understand what are the characteristics of an effective mentor, since many of you uh, will be mentors uh, to other physicians, to students, and you know how, you, how do you mentor? So we've actually created a training program for our faculty in mentorship. I can share with you some of the things that we provide them. We provide them a toolbox. We provide them the one-minute mentor paradigm and some other uh, tips on mentoring. Uh, and then they have computer-based learning modules on our, on our intra-college uh, website uh, that they can take. And then uh, under development uh, is measuring the outcomes. So this, is, this, I think, is the biggest challenge. How do you know that mentorship has actually been effective? And so we've, I've kind of put together some ideas and our team is rolling these out and I, you know we're not going to be able to measure anything really for another year or maybe two but we do have some baselines and we do know what we're going to be looking at so when you define mentorship uh, what I'm going to share with you is it means something different to everybody so it, it could mean a, a trusted advisor it could mean someone that is a coach, it could be someone that is promoting you and sponsoring you to get into the Society of University Surgeons or to get on the editorial board of a journal or those kind of things. It means something different to everybody. And I think we, we all reflect back, you know, where does this word mentor come from? Well, it comes from the Odyssey. And Athena, who, the goddess, took on the appearance of mentor to uh, basically advise Telemachus uh, about how to prepare for the returning uh, of Ulysses uh, and others uh, from the war and how they, he should develop strength and in, in character in order to lead uh, his people. And I think that this basically is translated into English as we think this is where mentor came from, from this Greek uh, mythology um, story. So I, you know, again, I propose to you that uh, mentoring uh, is a term that's widely used in academic medicine, but really there's not really consensus around how to operationalize it. Uh, and further, as I indicated in my closing remarks in my introduction, there's really no consensus on how to measure the effect of mentoring. Um, this is a quote from 2005, uh, kind of defining mentoring. It's a little bit long uh, to read. I'll let you read that to point out some of the uh, critical elements, which include uh, continuum of a relationship, knowledge and skills, wisdom, guidance, support, opportunity. These are all the types of uh, characteristics that are important in a mentoring uh, relationship. I think the one thing that is critically important, critically important, is that the mentor not be assigned. In other words, you need to have a period of time where the faculty member, the mentee, interacts with more senior faculty and decides, well, who, who can I go to to be my, who do I want to be my mentor? Once they make that decision and if the mentor agrees, then that really establishes the mentor-mentee relationship. If we went through and did a mentor.com, 
uh, like a dating service, um, it would not be effective. Um, and so I, I think that it really takes time. This is not something you do overnight. It's not something, you know, the residents arrive, you know, July 1st and July 2nd, they, they're assigned a mentor. I mean, uh, you know, probably premature uh, at that point. Phil Binkley, who uh, is one of our faculty members at Ohio State, defined the goal of mentorship is to move the mentee to the next career stage while maintaining professional career engagement and a sense of achievement, uh, both in personal and professional life. So it's more than just succeeding in your profession. It's also about that work-life uh, balance. So two years ago, um, after I was asked to do this, I said, well, I got to collect some information, right? So I went and I interviewed uh, all of the chairs, 18 uh, department chairs. Uh, at Ohio State, an hour interview each, and I, I had you know a list of questions, and we we discussed mentoring, and everybody had a different idea of what mentoring was, and these are some of the definitions that came out of it. And you'll recognize, you know, some of them will ring true to you, others won't, but I think the idea is is that many of the faculty, many of the leaders of the faculty, the chairs, had different ideas about mentoring. And I mean, some of them said, well, I can't be a mentor because I'm the boss. Others said, I have no interest in mentoring. Others said, uh, you know, I think it's just a developmental thing and uh, the faculty you know, can get mentoring from a peer or maybe I need to bring in another member of the faculty to run the mentoring program in our department. And I think it was just all over the board, uh, which was kind of a challenge. So. I took this back to the dean and I said, okay, we need to really formulate what we mean by mentoring and uh, do a needs assessment uh, across our organization. Uh, th this is another uh, reference to the false sense of consensus regarding mentoring because really uh, there, no one really has agreement on what it is. So we, we did a needs assessment and in our own institution. I think the first thing you need to do is show that mentoring makes a difference. And I'll share with you some data from Phil Binkley's study that he published in the American Journal of Medicine shortly that clearly indicates that faculty members who are engaged, this is in our Department of Medicine, faculty members who were engaged in mentoring were more likely uh, to remain at an academic medical center. They were more likely to advance in rank more rapidly. Uh, they had greater career satisfaction and uh, better career performance, including better teaching, increased quality of care, and they were more successful at obtaining extramural funding. This is in our Department of Medicine, and I'll share with you a little bit later some of that uh, objective uh, data. This is also true in industry. Uh, this is a results of a work analytics case study done at Sun. Uh, and they looked at the mentee and the mentor. And they looked at two uh, objective measurements. One, if the person had increase in compensation. And two, what the retention rate was. And you can see that the, the mentee if they had mentoring, was more likely to have a compensation increase while they were at Sun and were more likely to be retained, 72% versus 49%. The mentor, likewise, had benefits. So it's not just the mentee that receives the benefit of this relationship. The mentor also uh, received similar benefits uh, in that they also were observed uh, to have greater increases in compensation and a greater reten retention rate versus those that were not involved in the mentoring process. So there are benefits to the mentor, including uh, academic credit and in our institution. Uh, remember when I met with our dean, I said we needed to put some teeth to this. And so it's now in our promotion tenure document that to be uh, moved from the rank of associate professor to professor, you need to demonstrate mentoring. Um, and it will enhance their career 
and also provide higher rates of career satisfaction for the mentor. So, you know, basically when you talk to a faculty member who is associate professor, who's been at the institution for 10 years, who is, you know, has an NIH grant, you know, op, you know, operates three days a week or whatever, it's hard to get them to take on another responsibility. Uh, and so you need to put some reward uh, in it for them. And it, it's, not, it's not a monetary reward. Uh, you can't give people release time for mentoring. It's part of our professional obligation. But it should be part of our culture and part of our uh, promotion process. So the, uh, you know, based on my, my interviews with the chairs, I came away not only with the understanding that there was diverse definition of mentoring across the 18 departments, but the, there was extremely ver extreme variability in the engagement of the chairs in the mentoring process and the type of programs they had. There were formal and informal programs, so some, one of the departments that had many, many faculty would have one mentor meeting a year with the chair. And that was during their annual review. And I, I can assure you that that is ineffective. Uh, one, you don't have any relationship. Two, you forget what you said by the next meeting a year later. And it, so the mentoring relationship needs to be built over time and can't just be at, at end of the year review. That, that, that probably is not successful. The one I was most impressed with was the team mentoring in our basic science departments. And uh, it was amazing to watch these. And I, I went and observed some of these team mentoring. So there's a primary mentor and then three or four other faculty members from other departments that uh, had uh, relationships to the type of science that the individual mentee was doing. It was amazing to watch the impact of that on an individual uh, faculty member. The growth and development was incredible. And I saw one faculty member go from inability to get NIH funding, stymied at every step of the way, to now having uh, two R01s in about a two and a half year period of time. Having, now obviously there was a lot of work that the individual faculty member did, but there was a lot of encouragement, support, and help uh, provided by the mentoring team. Uh, you know, I already mentioned the chair and division chief, and we, we did find is that we had a diamond in the rough in our own hospital, our own medical center, and that was our Department of Medicine, actually had a pretty good mentoring program. Uh, Dr. Binkley had started that and had rolled it out, and I said, well, maybe we can learn from them and adopt that. So we also did... Uh, you probably do these too, these staff surveys periodically that everybody can't, you can't stand looking at the results. So th this was the result of our uh, survey of the faculty and staff. We carved out the faculty. So 600 of the 1,700 faculty responded. That's not bad for a survey. Uh, and you can see that uh, our faculty agreed, 15% agreed that they were receiving effective mentorship. So we got a problem. 67% uh, were neutral, and I've been told by the statisticians that analyze these that a neutral is a negative uh, on these. Uh, and then 18% disagreed. So we only had, you know, 15% of the faculty that were happy. So we, we had a problem. And, and this helped set the stage for our mentoring program. And then we, we went back and looked at the um, program developed in the Department of Medicine. Uh, let me take a minute here and walk you through this graph or this table. So this is uh, the faculty with mentors. These are gender and mentors, men, men and women, uh, women as mentors, uh, selection of the mentor, uh, frequency of meetings, and then faculty rank uh, that were involved. So you can see that about 51% of the faculty in Department of Medicine, this is the baseline study period for their rollout of their uh, distributed mentor model. So this goes back to reflect, this is the beginning. And you can see that about half of the faculty had mentors, about a third of the clinical faculty and uh, the majority of the tenured faculty had mentors. 
equally distributed between men and women, so gender was not a factor, and both uh, went, uh, men and women uh, could be mentors. So women as mentor, about 53%, men as 29%. Uh, interestingly, uh, self-identified mentors occurred in 89%. That's a positive. So they recognized early on that the uh, mentor needs to be selected by the mentee. You can see the quite a bit of variability uh, in in the uh, meeting frequency. You can see the 80, uh, 23 percent were annually, 26 percent were quarterly. You can see that the majority of uh, faculty, the head mentors, were assistant professors, and about a third of the associate professors. So, based on uh, what we learned at this time, we we felt that there were no standard definitions. No one was accountable. There was no unified program. There was no training. Um, what was the solution? Well, we had FAME. FAME is our faculty advancement, mentoring, and engagement. And I was asked to lead the mentoring part. So we had a home for the program. We were not sure of the uniform definition, but we were working on it. We thought the distributed model might work, and we needed to have help in the departments, and it couldn't necessarily be the chair. We needed to find other faculty that we could train up and have them be interested in the project, and then we were going to modify the APT document, critical, uh, and then monitor and assess. That's kind of where we are now, monitoring assessment. So let me take a digress a little bit and talk about fame. So. When we, when the LCME came through and looked at our medical school uh, eight years ago, they indicated to us that, you know, we weren't doing enough for our faculty. Uh, we didn't have enough programs to help faculty development. So basically we created FAME, uh, which is Center for Faculty Advancement, Mentoring, and Engagement. And we've identified uh, a number of uh, pillars uh, that help for faculty growth. And uh, you can see we focus on mentorship. We have a faculty leadership institute or faculty school. We just graduated our second class of that uh, last week. Uh, we, have a, uh, we have advancement for women. We have a very active women in medicine group and are creating an underrepresented uh, minorities in medicine group that, that will, uh, I think, really enhance our ability to engage that subgroup of our faculty, which is critically important. We have a human resources partnership, and we have consultation, and we give awards. So we, we have faculty achievement awards, we have research awards, we have a mentor award this year. So a faculty member will be given, a, and it's not a small amount of money, it's substantial. The mentor of the year award will be a substantial award for the college. And this is our uh, website uh, that's used uh, internally. And uh, so I think, you know, getting back to what the charge was, well, what do we mean when we say mentoring? So we basically came up with our, what we mean when we say mentoring at Ohio State. So uh, we think that uh, every resident, fellow, faculty member needs to identify a primary mentor. Needs to, this takes place uh, outside of the supervisor-employee relationship. Needs to be driven by the mentee career-focused, but might uh, work on some personal items as well, and a relationship initiated by the mentee, as I indicated, and it may cross uh, some job boundaries. Uh, the goal of this program, when we laid it out, is basically to provide accessible and meaningful engagement between a faculty member with an experienced and seasoned associate for purposes of career development and advancement, fostered by a spirit of collegiality and underscored by personal achievement and professional balance. So this sounds like the American flag, mom, apple pie, all those things. But this, I think, it is really what our program was designed uh, to do. The distributed model. So again, reflecting on our problem, so we wanted to roll out this program. We had 1,700 faculty, 900 residents and fellows. We had needs all over the charts, from basic scientists to clinical. Um, you know, we didn't, we didn't have enough mentors. 
I mean, you, you know, a mentor can only take two or three people. We only, and most of our faculty are assistant professors. So we had to figure out, you know, how to get through this challenge. So this was the, this was the results of the one-year assessment of looking at the Department of Medicine uh, numbers. So a year after they rolled out their new pro distributed model mentoring program, the faculty with mentors jumped from 51% to 71%. 68%, uh, almost two-thirds of the clinical faculty had mentors, almost doubling from what it was before. And almost 100% of the tenured faculty had a mentor when they initiated this program. Uh, again, there was no difference uh, in gender. Uh, the meeting frequency actually uh, changed uh, in that, uh, you know, there were some that were annually, quarterly, again, were present, but monthly actually increased uh, substantially uh, in this group, almost doubling, and that was statistically significant. And also, we found that our associate professors, many more of them had uh, uh, almost double, had uh, mentors and assistant professors likewise increased. So the distributed model in medicine seemed to work, at least for engagement. So we rolled that out. And it increased the number of faculty. Uh, we could see that impact in men and women uh, at all ranks, and it increased the frequency. So this is what our distributed model uh, looks like. So FAME is the faculty home. The chairs uh, obviously don't report to fame, but interact with it uh, in a leadership basis. We have identified 37 mentor leads across 18 departments. Uh, and the mentor leads uh, convene a meeting with the faculty and help the faculty identify their primary mentor. And we'll get into the definition of a primary mentor uh, in a minute. And it's these mentor leads that we have focused our initial work on in terms of training and engagement uh, during the past uh, 12 months. Um, and we've indicated to them that the, the responsibility of mentoring is uh, diverse. It's a, a role for every faculty member, and there must be evidence of the faculty member's involvement as a primary me mentor in the academic setting. This is lifted from our P&T document. So this, is, this language is embedded in our promotion tenure document uh, for associate to full professor. So, you know, mentoring has many, many roles. So, you know, Dr. Zollinger was one of my mentors, but he was more like a father figure, I mean, like a senior mentor. Um, and, you know, he pushed me beyond uh, what normal human beings could possibly do. But he, uh, he was a tremendous uh, influence on my life. Larry Carey was a great uh, mentor to me, but more of my boss, uh, but a actually promoted and helped me achieve the things that I've been able to accomplish. And Woody Hayes is the consummate coach, so I, I had to put the coach in there, because a coach can be a mentor. So what are the various uh, mentor types? So this is a list of uh, uh, categories of mentors, and there are many of them. We'll talk a little bit about a coach, a little bit about spine. And I think very importantly is this mentoring network. So, you know, we'll talk about that, but I, I want you to realize that you have a primary mentor, but your success is going to depend on your network of pe your peers and people that you work with across the area of your uh, main academic focus. So these are the standard uh, definitions, the content mentor, uh, leading edge information in the field, career mentor, guidance on career development decisions, life mentor, guidance that extends beyond professional development alone, the peer mentor, you know, how many of the residents as a junior resident are asked by an intern to give them advice? I mean, it happens all the time. Uh, so that's a daily occurrence, I think, in every setting. But I think the most important thing is this primary mentor. So primary mentor is someone that will help synthesize the information that the mentee has received and engage them, uh, advise them, and give them guidance, uh, blending basically what all of the other mentor types have fed into this individual so that they can, see, can succeed in their professional and personal uh, development. 
Now, now what about uh, co uh, coaches? Who, who has ever heard of a tool Gawande? Okay, every, I mean, it's like a household name in surgery, right? Okay, Tua Gawande was a great article. I don't know if anyone in the room had read it. Uh, it was written a couple years ago. Yeah, it was published in the New Yorker. And a tool yeah, is an endocrine surgeon, uh, Dr. Covey, and he uh, realized that he wasn't getting any better. It was kind of stagnant. And so he took the bold step of inviting one of his senior professors when he was training at, at Harvard at the Brigham back into the operating room to observe him to try to get to the next level. And it was a humbling experience for Dr. Gwande. And he relates how, uh, you know, the faculty member came into the room, you know, and Dr. Gwande is sitting there over the patient's uh, neck, big headlight on, loops for magnification, um, elbows out, uh, hunched over. Um, and he walked in the faculty member walked in the room and said, what is going on here? You don't need all this stuff. You don't need this headlamp. You don't need these loops. You know, we didn't teach you to do it that way. Stand back, stand up. And he said it made a huge difference uh, for him. Uh, and, and in that article, he talks about what coaches are and what they do. And he says, they're really not teachers, but they teach. They may or may not be your boss. Uh, and they don't really need to be an expert in what, what you're doing. Uh, because they can be just observers and be very objective uh, in what's going on. So they observe, they judge, and they guide. They can be your eyes and ears. They can help you break down performance into its individual component parts. So it's like, you know, learn, learning a golf swing. You know, as you know, I can't golf worth a darn, and I've I've had numerous lessons. And I figured out I have to give it up. But a tool actually was a pretty good tennis player. This is where he got the idea to bring a coach into the operating room uh, because he could. Um, he said it helped him with tennis. Should help me with surgery. So there are little differences between mentoring and coaching, and, and these are kind of outlined here. Um, you know, the coach really is goal performance improvement uh, and not necessarily focused on long-term career development. So it's very kind of specific interaction and, and engagement. The other thing that frequently comes up when you talk about mentoring is sponsorship. Uh, so this uh, book um, written by uh, Syl Sylvia Hewlett. Uh, basically, you need to really progress, you need someone to sponsor you. So you, it's more than a mentor. It's someone to take you under your wing and go, you're ready. Alan, you're ready to be promoted to associate professor. Let's go. Let's get your dossier ready, and we'll get you in the SUS, and, and push, push, push. That's what a sponsor does. And that might be different than a mentor. So I think that's important to consider. The mentoring network. So this is actually, uh, we have a program at Ohio State called SciVal. And you can go into SciVal and you can look at an individual faculty member and see how what does their network look like. So this is Michael Griever, who's our chair of uh, internal medicine. And he's a medical oncologist. And this is his network, hundreds, hundreds of people that he has interacted with. I mean, you can do this for any faculty member, and it's, it's really spectacular. But I think the point is being that you're not going to succeed if you just have a network which is in your local environment. You need a, a national network to really advance. And that might be through your science. It might be through your relationships. Uh, last night at dinner, we talked a little bit about the role of social media in helping create a network where, you know, when I was a trainee, we used to go to meetings every year. We used to go to two or three. Uh, when I was a young faculty member, you know, you go to academic surgery, SUS, you go to uh, Central Surgical, you know, you go to the uh, a, uh, a, a, a GI Week, SAGES, all those things. Well, now, I mean, the budgets are tight. You might be able to go to one meeting, uh, if that. Uh, you can get your CME online. And you need to have that connection. And 
you know, if you go to some of the uh, meetings that are available, Academic Surgery Week of note, there's a lot of people tweeting. And, you know, Twitter is probably an effective way to develop a network um, and meet people and to share ideas. There are journal clubs on Twitter every night. You can find a journal club to look at and go through, and you can meet people in SUS, AAS. It's, it's you know, I, I, two years ago, I would never have said this. But Ken Maddox came up to me at one of the meetings of the American Surgical and said, you know, Chris, we should get the American Surgical tweeting. And I can tell you, you know, that, that is like just the opposite of what you would think of the, you know, the uh, conservatism of the American Surgical Association. But, you know, he's got a point. You can connect. So the, the role and the functions we've laid out for our primary mentors are outlined here. Uh, you can see we asked them to meet at least quarterly. Um, you have to, we asked them to create a mentoring agreement where they agree and sign, both the mentor and mentee sign about what they're going to do, and what they're going to achieve. We help the mentee execute and develop a personal professional statement and a five-year plan that we'll talk about. They need to attend mentor training or do these CBLs, there are five of them uh, in our program and they need to attend our quarterly mentor lead meetings, uh, which we uh, so far have been on track uh, with nearly 100% attendance. And uh, very importantly, our APT document is really complex. And uh, in a room of new faculty, there were 100 of them in a room, I asked, how many of you know what track you're on? One hand went up. 99 of those 100 faculty had no idea that there were different tracks. The clinical track, clinical scholar, clinical educator, tenure track, research, faculty only. So it's important to help them navigate that. Uh, the primary mentor is a science, a little bit different, but um, pretty much the same as I'd indicated. Now, what are the characteristics of an effective mentor? I love this quote by Winston Churchill. We make a living by what we get, we make a life by what we give. So this is a giving role uh, on part of the, the mentor. So effective mentors are honest. They need to be honest beyond doubt. They need to be open and listen to the mentee's ideas and goals. They need to be willing and able to commit the time and be able to provide the mentee with formative feedback that is ongoing and can be directed. They should be inspiring and motivating. And I think this is the one where mentors fall off the chart most of the time. And that is fostering independence. So you can find uh, discussions of the predatory mentor. So someone, you go into the lab, and you're working with them, and you're writing all the papers, and you're writing all the grants, and you're getting none of the credit. And the, the mentor is, is consuming that young faculty member or resident's time uh, and really not giving anything in return. This, I think, is critically important not to let that happen. And that's the role of the primary mentor. The primary mentor may not be a content mentor for that individual, but they can recognize when that individual is in a predatory uh, mentorship uh, relationship. So they need to guide and help create this five-year plan and work with uh, the mentee to develop a network and, if possible, to sponsor them uh, in uh, their chosen field. So the training. So what do we provide? So you know, just like Facebook, we all know what Facebook is, but this guy didn't, right? So, uh, you know, we all know what mentoring is, right? We saw that at the beginning. Nobody knew. I don't know. I mean, we just, we're kind of working, we're working it out as we go along. So we need to actually help train uh, our mentors. And it, may, it might take a year to get everybody up to the same speed. Uh, so we've developed these modules. So our module one is an overview of mentorship with a definition expectations, what the outcomes might be, and language that's embedded in our P&T document. Module two is mentorship tools for career development, 
talks about the mentorship agreement, talks about the preparation of the personal mission statement. How, how many of the faculty have a personal mission statement? How many of the faculty have a five-year development plan? Great. So that's critical. If, if you don't have a plan and you don't have milestones in that plan, chances are you're going to be you know, kind of going all over the place. Uh, but I think uh, you know, very important to that also is your personal mission statement. And we work, we had a session where we had 100 new faculty and we basically wrote personal mission statements. So it was like, you know, like an exercise. Uh, and you know, I think some of the faculty thought it was ridiculous. Actually, most of the faculty thought it was actually pretty valuable. Uh, professional network assessment, that we have a tool that actually helps you assess your network. Uh, and then the five-year plan, which we talked about, is critical. Module three really is based on communication. So, you know, not everybody is an effective communicator. And this is probably the hardest thing to teach, but we try to go over an assessment of the individual's uh, communication style and to help them learn to be active listeners, uh, which is critically important, and to develop personal strategies for improving their ability to communicate uh, with their mentee. And then uh, four, we have mentoring for specific tracks. Might be a little bit different for clinical excellence, educator, scholar, research focus, et cetera. And then five, applied mentorship, kind of bringing it all together, uh, focusing really a lot of this on developing independence uh, in the mentee. So our uh, toolkit is here. So we have a timeline for the mentorship program. Uh, we have access to the mentorship modules. Uh, we have a milestone tracking form, uh, best practices uh, document, and then we have a variety of tools available kind of in our internal site, uh, which basically a list of faculty, mentoring agreement template, expectations, just everything you need to know. And one of the things we put in there, and this is a little pearl, is this one minute mentor. And I mean, this is not, we didn't invent this. We were borrowing it from Mitchell Feldman, who is a uh, physician at uh, UCSF and really has a, developed an unbelievable mentor program at uh, UCSF. And we tried to learn from him and actually had him come visit and model some of the things that we do well, what he does. But basically, the, you know, these are the elements of the one minute mentor. You can do it in the hallway. Uh, assess the mentee, go to check in, any urgent issues, set an agenda, assist with ongoing projects, be inquisitive, ask open-ended questions, maybe give directed advice, provide uh, career guidance, and then do a wrap-up and schedule the next meeting. So, you know, Feldman thinks you can do this in a minute. This looks more like five minutes to me, but. Uh, you know, he calls it the one-minute mentor. And I think the other thing is this individual development plan, which is, I can't emphasize the, the importance of this enough. Uh, it's used by NIH, the U.S. Coast Guard, Benchmark Industries. Why shouldn't we use it in academic medicine? Well, we should. And it's used, it's used, but it's not used widely. And it can be used not only in science, but in clinical uh, arena as well. So, you know, not only have we had to train the mentors, but we've had to train the mentees because this is a two-way street. Uh, and it's not like, you know, you go to the mentor's office and the mentee is not, doesn't have a role and responsibility. The mentee is driving this whole thing. So they need to identify the mentor. They need to make sure that they meet. They need to work on that mentoring agreement. They need to understand their faculty requirements. They need to write a five-year plan and a personal statement. They set annual goals, and they need to attend, uh, you know, sessions for the mentees uh, as well. So the final part of this is, well, how do we know we're successful? I have no idea. Uh, so this is all a uh, work in progress. So uh, we, we think that uh, we can have sev several measures of success. Uh, individual, that is, if the, in, if the individual faculty member hits their five-year 
milestones, I would call that success. Um, you can look at academic productivity, publications, NIH grants, uh, reputation, satisfaction, engagement. Uh, then there can be global factors that we can measure, time to promotion, percent success in promotion. In other words, you know, what is your average faculty success in being promoted? Ours is 80%, uh, which is pretty good. Um, this year it was 85%. Um, so again, it's a moving target. I think that's important. Faculty retention. Our faculty retention, uh, and you can get this information from the AAMC. I have it for the entire College of Medicine for the past decade, and our retention numbers have gotten worse. Uh, and the average AAMC retention is about 6%. That includes MD and PhD faculty, and ours is about 7.5%. Uh, and it's gone up from 5% over the past several years. And you know, I think it's an increasingly competitive marketplace, and we need to figure out ways to engage our faculty and retain them. Uh, this is one uh, questionnaire of me measuring mentorship that was developed uh, at Johns Hopkins. This is too complicated for me, but if you can look at it if you want. It's in the uh, Academic Medicine 2005. So I, I think it, it's very important to have simple measures, something that you can easily get the data for. Uh, and so this is theory, this is what we're working on. So is, we haven't put this in, totally into place yet, although we've done a baseline. So we look, we look at the publications and we give them points. We look at productivity. We'll give them points for research productivity for faculty members that are less than point five clinical FTE. That means they have two and a half days a week of free time to do research and work on academics. And those focus more on clinical with their clinical productivity look at their teaching uh, responses, patient satisfaction, inpatient and outpatient, their, their faculty satisfaction, their engagement score. And then for the basic science faculty, it's a little bit different scale, only up to 20 points and on similar elements, but without the clinical uh, space uh, being assessed. And so this will be done semi-annually. And so, you know, in six months, we'll assess, see where we are. And this is a hypothetical. So this would be, you know, this is a good performing assistant professor faculty greater than 0.5 clinical FTE. You can see year one, two, three, and four. You can see, you know, over time they, in the first half, <coughs> second half of the year, they gradually increase their overall composite score, knowing that a maximum score is 28 by year four. So this, this is what we would hope to see. Uh, this is what we would not want to see. Uh, and this is where, you know, the faculty member begins to do well and then falls off and you do the drill down and you find out that it's poor patient satisfaction scores that are driving uh, that poor performance. I mean, I love these uh, radial graphs. So, uh, and this is, a, this is a faculty member that is hypothetically on the tenure track, uh, focused on research. They have at least two and a half days a week. And you can see that, uh, you can see the year one, their total score was 10, and you can see where they were hitting their targets. And then year uh, four, you can see they're hitting their targets in publication. They're engaged, they're satisfied. Uh, they have pretty good inpatient and outpatient scores, and they have very good teaching scores, but there's a big quadrant missing. So that says to me, this faculty member needs to switch tracks. They, they are not going to succeed on this tenure track, research track, they need to be on a clinical track. So you can actually use this information uh, to help. So in summary, uh, you know, we've gone over uh, how we define mentorship, the impact of mentoring. Uh, I think it's critically important to have a mentoring home, and that real, that's a responsibility of your college of medicine. I think that the, you know, really there needs to be a home that's, you can start in surgery, but you need the support of the entire university and the medical center and the college to really make it work. You can't do it alone. You have to have a core group of, of mentor leads that may, that usually are not the chairs. It's usually someone else in the department. Um, we reviewed the uh, mentor categories. We reviewed the 
key elements of a mentor, including fostering independence, being honest uh, with your mentee, the importance of the mentor training. So we, you know, March 1st, we actually rolled out our modules on our internal website, and they're being assessed, looked at, and uh, we know the completion rates on those. And then we're going to measure the outcomes. So hopefully in a couple of years, we'll know if this has been successful or not. Anyway, it's been a great visit to West Virginia University School of Medicine, Department of Surgery. I thank uh, the faculty and staff and uh, for the uh, invitation. Dr. Covey, it was very nice uh, giving your name lecture yesterday. And I'm looking forward to the resident case presentations. I'd be happy to answer any questions at this point. Thank you. Uh, we have time for questions, and uh, I also take uh, the opportunity to invite everyone who wants to stay for uh, case management discussions. Uh, some of the cases that we're going to present are going to be uh, very illuminating, so I encourage everyone to stay who's interested. Any questions? I've got, yeah, go ahead, Greg. Uh, <clears throat> I think chair engagement. That was the big, that, I think that some of the chairs did not view this as important. And right, to, to getting buy-in I think was critically important. You know, surprisingly, you know, we already had fame. We had the staff to make it work and we had the funding to make it work. So that, you know, everybody, that's usually the hard part. But for us it was, it's cultural. <clears throat> So it's getting the chairs to buy into the fact that mentoring is important. We had one department where the chair, you know, he signed, you know, he brought in a faculty member from another department to run the mentoring because he was not interested. And, you know, that's a success for, that's not going to succeed. A formula for failure uh, and the mentoring. The chair has to be engaged. They don't have to be the mentors, but they have to be out there waving the flag. And I think, uh, you know, putting it in the P&T document made a big difference, or will make a big difference. We'll, you know, this is just rolling out, but engagement, number one barrier. Um, how do you manage the clinical burden and the, and the incentives for RVU generation? Well, <clears throat> that's a million-dollar question. <laughs> so, you know, we're all... When, when I was chair of surgery, the faculty would, uh, they had a joke, Dr. Ellison looks at us as though we're walking RVUs. And uh, I think the balance is, is critically important. Um, unfortunately, the reality is that uh, increasingly in academic medicine, we're funding our academic missions from clinical revenue uh, at Ohio State. Uh, two-thirds of our academic missions, two-thirds are s funded by clinical revenue, either from the professional fees or department. So it's critically important. But it's also critically important to find balance uh, in individual faculty members' life. So I think, you know, RVUs are critical, but faculty can buy time, so to speak, uh, in terms of research funding if they have grants, teaching funding from the College of Medicine for doing teaching. And so we have mission-based budgeting that basically, so money is transferred to the department based on teaching effort. Uh, and that can offset clinical responsibilities. You know, in some faculty, they're clinical machines. And I love that. I mean, that's great. I mean, uh, I've, we've got a neurosurgeon that did 29,000 RVUs last year. I mean, that's unbelievable. Uh, and, you know, they don't do any teaching and they don't do any research, but, you know, they're, they're great. Uh, and so I, I think it, it takes all kinds of people to have a successful department and a successful college of medicine. You're going to have some superstars in clinical arena. You'll have other people that are, um, you know, great teachers and have a lot to offer for your residency program or your medical students, and they, they should receive funding from the hospital well, for those things. I was impressed that a lot, you know, the key part of engagement is this mentoring process because I think that's how you get or get people aligned and 
and, and maintain alignment with, uh, with the mission. And I, think, I think this is actually a, a keystone of all that. Yeah, it's a cornerstone of making this work, it is kind of using the mentoring as a way to engage the faculty. Rick. That's the hardest thing. Um, well, obviously, if you're tenured, I mean, you're you're home free, right? I mean, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to write a grant anymore. You don't, you know, basically, you know, that that is a real conundrum. And frankly, I think we ought to do away with tenure. Uh, but you know, that 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 would never pass the muster at the at the. Uh, Office of Academic Affairs at Ohio State, so I think we're stuck with it. But I think, um, I think really, uh, if if you get a core group of tenured faculty that are engaged, they can p put peer pressure on the on the others to be involved. And I, I think that sounds simple. That's really the only stick that you, you have is peer pressure, and they have to want to do it. I mean, if they had a good if you know, the other thing we found is if someone had a good mentor, they're much more likely to mentor. So we hope that this will build over time, you know, the pool of senior faculty that, that do want uh, to mentor. I think, you know, we, we can talk offline about how to manage the uh, salary and, and those types of things of tenured faculty that are not performing and there are, you know, there are ways to do that. but. That's beyond the scope of this conversation. So I think if it's the peer pressure, and you know, not everybody can be a mentor, and not every faculty member wants a uh, wants a mentor. So we have faculty that of new faculty that do not want a mentor. They have no interest in that. That's fine with me. I mean, they they can go on and do whatever they want. At the end of the day, they're going to be measured by the same yardstick that the other faculty are, and actually, that's our control group. Uh, so if they self-select that they, well, I don't want a mentor, I'm, I'm a loner, I don't want to be engaged, great. Well, at the end of the day, they're going to be measured by the same yardstick that everybody else is. So, but, and, and we can't force it on them. I mean, you have to, if, the, if a resident doesn't want a mentor, then uh, I, I wouldn't force it on them, for example. It'd be kind of productive. You know, one, two, th two points that you made really resonated and one is the value of the mentors and I think that both you and I have been fortunate in having an array of mentors that really propelled us to to where we could then take advantage of a network and so it's a two-pronged kind of phenomena where you have a where you where you have a mentorship and then you start to develop a network and the network the value of social networks is uh, is emerging as a primary driver of professional success. Yeah, absolutely. I, I was mentioning last night at dinner, so someone asked me who my mentors were, and I said, well, you know, Robert Zollinger was like the mentor uh, and probably taught me more about patient care and paying attention to detail and not giving up and follow through and those basic type of elements. Larry Carey was really a career mentor for me, and he actually develop my, help me develop my network of people that I count on. So uh, Jay Grossfeld, um, Hiram Polk, um, and then after I got involved with the board, Frank Lewis, and then another layer of networking developed from being on the board, Fabrizio Michelassi, Barbara Bass, Julie Freischlag, you know, and then it just, op once you get into the door, it just opens up these networks that are just unbelievable. But the key is you've got to get in the door and that's where your sponsor or promoter can really help. Great visit. Again, uh, I invite everyone to stay for the case, uh, case discussions. It's already been an outstanding uh, visit, but uh, again, on behalf of the department, sir, thank you very much, Dr. Austin. Don, thank you. I enjoyed it. Enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Take a short break and then